Well, welcome. Um, good morning, and welcome to this session on Can Farming Improve the Lives of Rural Women and Girls? Um, I'm Cheryl Doss. I'm an associate professor and senior departmental lecturer at Oxford. I'm a development economist um, and have been working on these issues for many, many years. Um, Today is the 10th anniversary of the International Day of Rural Women. So it's a very appropriate day to think about these questions about sort of the bigger question about how do we improve the lives of rural women and girls? And then in particular, where does farming fit in? So I think that's probably more the way we're gonna be framing this today. Um, it's striking that after all the years that many of us have been working on issues around women and gender and agriculture, that rural women and girls are still fairly invisible, um, particularly when they're engaged in smallholder farming. We've seen more and more attention being paid to them when they're the heads of household, and also when they're seen as the farm managers, so when they have their own plots of land, we're now starting to collect data on them so we can understand what they're doing but all of the many roles that they still play when they're not the primary farmer, but are engaged in agriculture in a male-headed household or on a male-managed farm are still somewhat invisible. Um, and I think that issues of gender and women are still somewhat of an add-on in many of, much of the work that's being done on the commercialization of agriculture um, and on agricultural value chains. So some of these issues are gonna come up today. So what we're going to do is we're going to start out with hearing presentations from Steve, Steve Wiggins and then Agnes Anderson Yerfeld, and then we're going to hear from our two other panelists, and I'll introduce everybody in more detail in just a minute. We'll then open it up for discussion, both from those of you in the room, and I believe we have quite a few people today who are online. If you're online, please send your questions and your comments in the chat box, and I will get them. Um, helpful if you make them short and clear, um, and I will get them here and try to bring them into the conversation as well. Um, I'm asked to tell you to turn your phones to silent but not off, um, <laughs> and to join the conversation on Twitter, Twitter using the hashtag Rural Women and the handle at ODI Dev, and the Wi-Fi codes are on the screens. So let me introduce the panelists. Um, Sally Baden is an agricultural economist specializing in gender and development and women's rights. She currently leads the Women's Economic Empowerment Portfolio at Social Development Direct, which is a specialist consulting firm focused on gender and social inclusion. She has over 25 years in the sector, including seven years based in West Africa. Sally's on my right. Anita um, Girme is the research director at the Nepal Institute for Social and environmental research and course coordinator for gender and social inclusion at the College of Development Studies in Kathmandu. She's got a PhD in human and natural resource studies from the University of Zurich and Kathmandu University. Then we have farther on my left is Agnes Anderson Yerfeld, a professor in human geography at Lund University in Sweden and team leader of the Afrint Group, an interdisciplinary group of researchers studying changes in rural livelihoods in sub-Saharan Africa since, 20, since 2002. And finally, Steve Wiggins is the pre principal research fellow in the Agricultural Development Program here at ODI. He's been studying and working on agricultural and rural development issues in Africa and Latin America since 1972. So we're going to start with Steve. <laughs> That's what's in front of me, Steve. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> um, we're going to start with Steve. So. Thank, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, 11 and a bit minutes is the study that we were invited to do in the middle of 2016 by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation when they asked us the following fascinating question. What kind of agricultural development makes a real difference to the lives of rural women and girls? And this is what we found out when we approached that rather good question to ask. Now, the most relevant of the things that we did to answer that question proved to be 
three long-term studies from 90, the early 1960s to the 2010s of development and change in three countries, Egypt, Peru, and Thailand, um, two of those countries being low-income countries in 1960s. They're all middle-income countries today, two of them upper-middle-income countries. And the way that we framed the analysis was to say, OK, agricultural development is part of overall economic growth. It's part of structural transformation. And it's that agricultural development within the processes of growth and development that provide conditions by which the lives of rural women and girls change in four dimensions, as economic participants, as farmers, and other things, as mothers, carers, and wives, as people in their own human development, and as citizens and agents. So we looked at those four dimensions and related them to the overall growth processes that we saw in those cases. And what we saw was five principal lessons that came out of that. And those five lessons go as follows. Now the first one is this is that the biggest and most significant changes to the lives of rural women came with employment and jobs that were beyond the farm. It re agriculture mattered, but it didn't matter quite as much as what was happening with the rural non-farm economy, with the possibility of jobs created by commuting to local rural service centers, and through migration to towns and cities. So that's our first and big message. Our second message is this, that rural women can only take up those particular economic opportunities if they have good health, good education, they're literate, they're numerate. So a huge importance of rural education, um, rural health services, clean water, good sanitation. Now, Thailand is the exemplary case of the three countries that we looked at. And if we look at what Thailand has done since, uh, since the 1960s, we can show charts like this. This is secondary school <coughs> enrollment going up from one in five children in the year 1970 to 80-90% of, of children by now. Um, there was a slight gender advantage to, to boys originally. By now, if there's any gender bias, it's actually slightly towards girls. Uh, the observant there will notice that the enrollment levels were actually quite low until about 1990. And in that lies an interesting, quest, an interesting thing that you'll see in all economic history. Countries make mistakes. Making mistakes is not important. It, uh, the important thing is to correct them. And the Thais realized uh, by the 1980s that they'd really undercooked their secondary education. It was going to cost them. And they ramped it up from then on. Um, here's a proxy for health services, the under five mortality rate, and you can see that back in the early 1960s it was about 150 per thousand, uh, six, what is that, one in six children dead before the age of five, and it came down very quickly towards the 1990s, and today it's a very low number indeed. A third message is the one that surprised me. I really wasn't expecting to see this when we did these economic histories, the importance of family planning. Well, obviously, family planning is important in terms of empowering people to take care of their own fertility, but we were finding pretty strong effects through the labor markets. Ten years after you get a family planning program started, which is effective, then you get big effects into the rural labor market. So this is the case of Thailand on the right. That's from 1970. In the late 1960s, early 1970s, Thailand initiated or had formulated a model family planning program in rural areas that is arguably the most successful the world has ever seen. And the success is all about doorstop, de doorstep delivery by female paramedics to rural women, yeah? It's rural women to rural women within the village, no need to go to a clinic, no need to talk to a man in a white coat. 
non-coercive, uh, we have the means if you want them, and the result was a massive uptake of contraception that you can see on that, and by modern times it's about an 80% uptake in, in rural areas. And that, there's the diagram showing fertility rates, six births on average per woman in the early 1960s, a very high rate indeed. Thailand at that time had 3% per annum population growth, which <coughs> did concern policymakers at the time, but you can see that it came down quite dramatically by the 1990s. Today, Thailand has uh, birth rates, uh, sorry, uh, fertility rates well below two. They're on European levels, and even in rural areas, they are 2.1 a natural replacement rate. Now, we'll see in a couple of slides' time what happens. No, we see it here. What has been the outcome in Thailand of a series of processes? Thailand had successful economic growth from the 1960s onwards, and that has featured uh, very strong agricultural development based around farm exports, but it has also seen strong growth of the rural non-farm economy. Thanks to a slowdown of the population growth rate and a rise in economic activity, the labor market significantly tightens from 1990 onwards. Do be aware, for those of you who are historians, this is 30 years into the story, yes? 1990 is now quite a long way away, but it's 30 years into the story. But from that moment onwards, the labor market tightens with really significant advantages for rural women. And as that happens, the Gini coefficient of inequality falls and rural poverty falls. Uh, this chart here, it's not that easy to see, I'm afraid, shows from the early 1990s to the mid-2000s the growth in real terms of women's wages. And um, what you can see is that for a range of activities, from being a farm worker through to being a professional, the wages are going up. What you can't quite see in that diagram, unless you've got eagle eyes and you're good at uh, uh, comparing lengths of line, is that the percentage gains to women's wages in real terms are actually highest for the agricultural field workers. So this is a growth which is not only favoring women, but is favoring women at the bottom end of the income scale in rural areas. Fourth finding from our studies, not a surprising one, of course, is that gender norms count. Uh, in the case of Thailand, which is the exemplary case, women, it wasn't well thought of for rural women to migrate to urban areas, um, but no great obstacles were put in the way of that migration and rural women left in droves for the assembly plants which had been set up for domestic work, for working in shops, and so on. That made a very big difference in the case of Thailand. It also more recently makes a case, a difference to the case of Peru, but where it doesn't make a difference <laughs> is in Egypt, where women's mobility is strictly circumscribed in a village to staying inside of the household compound, perhaps onto the local fields, but unsupervised travel by women is simply unthinkable, with the odd result that the Egyptian hotel industry is almost entirely staffed by men, which is an industry which anywhere else tends to provide a large amount of women's employment. Our fifth lesson is this is that whilst the critical issues making a difference to rural women may not be first and foremost agricultural, that does not mean that there isn't a lot of really important things that can be done for women farmers who tend to be disadvantaged in giving them access to land rights, better access to finance, inputs, and technical assistance. And finally, just to summarize, what empowers rural women and girls, or at least materially empowers them? Well, we get the better op economic opportunities. We get more choice. When we've got agricultural development and transformation creating more incomes rurally, 
When fertility falls, when women have to spend less time on childcare and less money on bringing up the children, when we've got jobs and businesses which are accessible off the farm, rural labour markets are really important in this, and when women are mobile. Agriculture and rural development then become preconditions, really important preconditions for wider economic change. And if you couple that with rural public investment in health services, education, family planning, clean water and sanitation, that should make quite a difference. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm going to turn to Agnes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, I'm waiting for my slide. I don't know if it's... There we go. Okay. So um, I would like to spend the next 15 minutes or so answering uh, three questions um, based on um, a study that we've been undertaking since 2002. And the questions are simply whether lives of women in rural Africa have improved over the past decade. If so, what role has farming um, played in that improvement? <coughs> and finally, how could their lives be improved, more broadly speaking? But I'd, I'd like to start by saying something about the background to our study and what type of data we have collected. Um, so as Cheryl mentioned, we've been collecting data since 2002. Uh, the original aim of, of the project when it started was to look at conditions for agricultural intensification or sort of a, a green revolution-led um, process also in the case of sub-Saharan Africa. This was inspired by a comparison with South Asia and India in particular. Um, and countries were selected in the maize and cassava belt in sub-Saharan Africa, so uh, looking at the potential for this type of intensification. Um, in terms of the particular study sites that were selected, they were also selected among um, uh, regions that were considered to hold some sort of potential for this. So they're not the very uh, very marginal areas, but not the, the really um, outstanding sort of well-publicized uh, issues of intensification either. But we have a data set that covers six countries, 50 regions, and 56 villages, uh, and around 2,500 farm managers for each uh, data collection phase and data was collected in 2002, 2008, and 2013. And as Cheryl uh, pointed out, most uh, data that is collected on, on women in sub-Saharan Africa is uh, based on interviewing the farm manager or the female landholder, whereas, of course, most women actually live in households headed by men. <laughs> uh, and we've, tr we've tried to deal with this, so the quantitative data, um, I should acknowledge, is then collected from from the self-identified farm manager, which in around a third of cases is a woman. Uh, but we've also tried to complement this with intra-household qualitative data from around 300 interviews, uh, which looks at uh, the gender division of labor um, and uh, how production as well as commercialization decisions are made within, within households. So if I return then to the first question. Have the lives of women in rural Africa improved over the past decade? Um, and I would say in some respects, yes. We have uh, data on housing standards, and this has generally improved since 2002. We find that um, the share of households living in brick or block houses with iron sheeted roofing and uh, concrete floors has, has doubled since 2002, and there's no gender bias between households headed by men and households headed by women. Uh, we also <coughs> see that the ICT revolution has swept across the, the sample areas. So uh, when we started the project, only 3% 3 3 of the households actually reported having access to a phone of any kind. And now we see that 67% have access to a phone. Um, and this is also gender neutral. So in that sense, there has been improvements. We also see that possibilities for saving has also improved. So um, in 2002, 40% of the households stated that they could save for future needs. Now we see that 55% at the end of the period uh, claim to be able to save for future needs. But in the process, the gender gap has widened. So um, 
and qualitative data generally confirms this, these tendencies. We also see it visibly in, in housing standard improvements, for instance. So then the next question is, well, how has farming been instrumental in this to the extent that we see improvements? Are they based on farming? Um, and with any data set of this kind, which spans a lot of countries and a lot of regions, uh, I think we need to acknowledge that it's, it's very difficult to generalize. Uh, we can see that agricultural commercialization <coughs> is heavily concentrated to Zambia and to a lesser extent Ghana and Tanzania. Whereas in Malawi, um, for instance, um, uh, commercialization has not been as, as pronounced in maize in particular. Uh, we see that in Malawi, Tanzania and Mozambique, there's a f commercialization of other food crops, so non-staple crops that are being masculinized over time. So market participation is increasingly being masculinized in these crops. Whereas in Kenya, there's a feminization of other crops. So it's, it's very hard to say, well, it's, it's a wholesale sort of um, movement towards a, a male-driven male commercialization process. Um, in the case of Sambia, we see that maize, maize commercialization has actually benefited both female and male farm managers, but there is a widening gender gap in this context. Um, and farm sizes have, and livestock herds have at the same time uh, increased in some countries, most notably Zambia again, Ghana, Mozambique, and Tanzania. <coughs> but this has been accompanied by a polarization of farm size based on gender of the farm manager. Um, so where farm size increases have occurred, they have tended to benefit male uh, farm managers. Uh, and the same goes for livestock. Um, where herds have been, been uh, restocked or built up, they've tended to men benefit male-headed households. And what this, this does is it translates into widening income gaps between male and female-headed households, uh, which are actually entirely based on farm incomes. So there's a very strong connection to farm income and, and, these, uh, and increased commercialization and widening income gaps. Uh, what we also see is that women living within male-headed households have even poorer possibilities for generating farm-based incomes than do women who head their own farm uh, or their own households. Um, and it seems, therefore, that the division of labor in male-headed households is such that women do unremunerated work, strongly focused on agricultural production and caring for, for children or, or the care burdens of the household, uh, whereas men control the sale of agricultural produce. So commercialization and command of incomes generated from the work of women within those households tend to be um, benefiting men. Um, but there are some aspects that unite the households that, or the women that head their own households and, and women within uh, male-headed households. And those are the ones re related to what Steve was pointing to, restrict restrictions in mobility is, is common to both types of sort of rural women. Uh, social norms that restrict mobility and lack in capital. And the restrictions to mobility are related largely to very heavy care burdens, so very labor-intensive um, burdens of, of looking after children, looking after ailing relatives or disease, um, where, where women are, are sort of tied to the village. Um, uh, but there are also crucially, crucial differences between women who head their own households and women who live in households headed by men. So in the case of women who live in households <coughs> headed by men, the disincentives to commercialization and agricultural production are based on their relationship to their husband. <laughs> because if he controls the sale of the goods that are produced within the households, they will have quite strong disincentives to commercialize. Uh, whereas women who head their own households lack access to male labor and male representation in village contexts where this may be very important to access key uh, resources for agricultural production. For instance, uh, plowing or accessing uh, tractors or, or um, improving um, access to, to male labor more generally. Um, <clears throat> so how then could women's lives be improved? What should, what should we do about this? <laughs> uh, so it might be tempting to conclude then that women should simply leave agriculture, but this is a sort of no-starter. Uh, 
but it needs to be recognized that agriculture is still the mainstay of, of uh, rural livelihoods and still um, <coughs> contributes around 70% of rural incomes in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and at the same time, there are limited opportunities for, for um, uh, well, generating incomes outside agriculture. And this has to do with the nature of African urbanization, which is very different from, from that of Southeast Asia. Um, it also has to do with um, well, poor infrastructure, poor accessibility to, to urban areas, and, and um, uh, which means that this is likely to be the case for the, also for the foreseeable future, uh, that there is this dependence on agriculture. Um, at the same time, our data on the processes of non-farm diversification, so finding livelihood sources outside agriculture, is actually not biasing female household heads. Uh, so you might expect a, a, a gender bias, but there is none. So this is, seems to be a neutral, gender neutral process. And our income data based on intra-household um, data also suggests that there's more room for generating income from non-farm sources for women within male-headed households than from farm sources. Um, while, as I suggested initially, ownership of non-farm assets seems to have increased over time, so improving housing standards, for instance, or um, telephones. So in this sense, uh, diversification into the non-farm sector seems to make sense. Um, uh, and therefore, improving the lives of rural women needs to take a more comprehensive approach that includes farm and non-farm sources uh, of incomes, as well as a broader livelihoods perspective. Um, this means, for instance, that women within a particular production system, so let's say you have what is widely known as an extensive production system relying on a lot of land, such as Zambia, women within that system may actually have, say, face a different set of constraints than do men in, in those systems. So there's a need for improving productivity within agriculture uh, in a gender-sensitive way that recognizes variations within particular subsystems, even at the very local, uh, almost village level, that takes, um, takes gender into consideration. But there are also a set of broad-based interventions of the type that Steve mentioned. Uh, for instance, improvements in child uh, health care or health care facilities for children, reducing infant mortality, electrification, improving access to clean water that would um, release women's, um, well, improve women's lot <laughs> more generally speaking, and also enable women to actually use their labor for more productive purposes uh, and possibly remunerative purposes. Um, and it would also um, release some of the labor constraints, or not labor, but mobility constraints that they experience today uh, by making them less uh, tied to the household. Um, but then strategies that improve the possibilities for earning an independent income in the non-farm sector, at least in the short term, uh, will need to be based on very localized contexts. So recognizing that women are constrained in their mobility, uh, we would need to think of low skills, low capital uh, intense uh, types of production in the non-farm sector, uh, perhaps linked to the, um, to the farming sector but also um, dealing with needs that everyone in the village has. Um, the only thing I can think of <laughs> that fits this, and there, might be, uh, there may be other suggestions, would be to uh, manufacture, for instance, menstrual hygiene products. Everyone needs them in the village. Um, it's a very localized type of production, and it requires little skills. Um, so I think these would be... Uh, ways in which li women's lives could be improved. Um, and then lastly, the important point on social norms, because social norms are difficult to change. What we found um, in uh, doing field work uh, in Tanzania, a very small study, so I'm, I'm not sure about the generalizability, is that there's a strong issue of demonstration effects. So in any system where you're essentially disenfranchising one group of people, uh, in terms of land rights, for instance, or you're, you're saying, well, the agricultural resources are dominated by men, we're going to take them away from this group of people. You need to demonstrate 
to that group of people that it makes sense also for them. <laughs> and what we found in, in interviews actually in male focus groups was that the demonstration effect of improved housing standards where men could look at their neighbors' houses and say, well, actually, there's a woman who's involved in agriculture who's improving the house of this particular man because he lets her farm on her own fields. And they now have this nice house. And therefore, it makes sense for my family to do the same thing. Um, so I think that the demonstration effects in, in changing social norms, whether concerning mobility or concerning women's access to agricultural resources, is one that um, needs to be considered uh, in these processes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I think one of the things I heard from both of you is kind of how some of these things intersect, particularly issues around mobility that we often attribute to being about social norms, which is true in, in Egypt, but how time use and all the kinds of constraints and responsibilities that women have also play into that as well, so that we've got to think about how both of those things fit in together. Before we go to our two panelists who are going to respond, I thought I would see if there was a question or two, particularly anything kind of clarifying questions for either of our first two speakers. Anybody got something burning? Yes. Um, we need a microphone, right? Otherwise, yes. So the people online can hear you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Mostly it's for them to be able to hear. We can hear you. And if you could introduce yourself, that would be, there we go. Good morning. My name is Sabina Garbarino, Adam Smith International. I have one question for Steve. I was really interested to hear about uh, female wages going up in your case study. How does that compare to the male wage, uh, wages over the same period of time? Thank you. Very, very fast answer to that. Uh, gap is closing. There is a gap, it's closing. But the gap is still there. <laughs> Good. Anything? One, one more over here. And then we'll... Thank you very much, uh, panel. My name is Antoinette Salah. Um, I'm an uh, independent agricultural consultant and a member of uh, TAA, that's the Tropical Agriculture Association. Uh, my question is to uh, Agnes. Uh, where women own land and farmed uh, manually or mechanically, did their lives improve in the case studies that you gave us? So you mean if, if they owned land? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> These are issues of land tenure and access. Ah, OK, OK. <laughs> so you mean if, if they did not just have access to land, but they actually had a certificate? Yeah. Is that what? Yes, they yeah. own the land. Yeah, they have um, like we, we haven't looked at that particular aspect. We've looked at whether they held de had title deeds, and we looked at the process of that compared, to, uh, compared with male uh, farm managers. And we see that uh, to the extent that deeds have been titled, which is there's been a small rise in titling over, over the period, uh, there, it has been accompanied by, by a gender gap. But in general, around a quarter of the sampled households have titles to their land or certificates. I mean, it's been formally recognized. Yeah, but did their lives improve? That we haven't looked at, not for that particular subgroup, no. Great, I'm gonna go back to our respondents here and start with Anita and let her. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think, I mean, in terms of, I mean, if we look at our work, <laughs> Uh, I mean, a lot of uh, what Steve has said resonates. Of course, we are in a different phase of development, and so the the uh, the kind of um, trend or the uh, how fast it is happening is not similar. But we have ha gone through a similar issues. I would say that the pathways are similar. But I'd also like to say, from my observation and experience in Nepal, that it's been like two step forward and one step back. We have had factors that are high enabling. But also factors that are, you know, that are hindering you know, women's um, overall well-being. So I mean, just like uh, Steve says, like migration to towns and cities, 
there are social norms which are very restrictive. So migration has been taking place. Women have been increasingly migrating to mostly like you know the the um, urban areas, but also very much to the for labor migration in Gulf. But it's very it's very small if you compare to uh, the amount of male migration. It's like less than three percent of women, and there are huge um, kind of uh, huge repercussions around that. There's a huge uh, tendency to stop women's migration, both in the national level and also if you go to the communities and all. So there are very restrictive norms for women's migration. I mean, hearing what uh, Steve said and what um, Agnes said, I would say that, I mean, if I had to say about women, I would say that there has to be like, I would place agriculture as like, you know, for any norm change, I, I would suggest that there has to be like, two different prongs of intervention. One is the more broad-based, and there, is, there comes economic empowerment and work on agriculture transformation. But also whether, I mean, in Nepal, it's just uh, subsistence agriculture. So I think, I mean, hearing from Agnes and Steve, I think whether it's really just agriculture but, or whether it's like agro-entrepreneurship so that you don't move completely out of agriculture. But, you know, I mean, given the norms around mobility, uh, restrictions in mobility, as you found in Nepal, in South Asia, there are also other restrictive norms around social interactions, around um, access to uh, property, just like um, you were saying that, the, I mean, land entitlement is a big issue. So if we look at that, I think agriculture entrepreneurship might be like, you know, a, a small, I mean, of course, of farm labor is critical, but still looking at uh, how we can go without really challenging everything and dismantling everything. I think agri introducing agriculture and entrepreneur entrepreneurship is, it might look like the first, second step there. And then we also have to look at other individual factors. I think we cannot talk uh, about uh, economic transformation in isolation, I mean, provision of services, as Steve talked about, I mean, she has, I mean in, in context where there's a lot, there's a lot of gender-based violence, you cannot talk about women's economic transformation or economic empowerment without addressing uh, gender-based violence. So, I mean, providing services around uh, education, health, but also justice, um, uh, establishing relationship to market, but creating market linkages are also like essential features as well as individual factors, I think, such as like, you know, bringing up women's voice and agency, clear, creating platform for them in decision making. And then most, most importantly, working with men and boys who are gatekeepers of these norms to, to make a positive impact on women's economic empowerment, I think is, is essential. Great. Go to Sally. Yeah. Thank you, um, <laughs> and great to hear these two um, uh, really rich presentations. And I, I think you got the kind of headlines, but there's a lot more sort of depth of analysis behind those that um, you can read in the studies. And I think it's really um, important that they've brought this sort of kind of long view um, and in really integrated thinking about gender and gender and social dynamics in the sort of broader understanding of structural transformation. And I think that's a really uh, for me, a really um, richness of, of both of these um, studies and, you know, going back to the, the, the work of people like Esther Bozrat back in the 70s of trying to understand gender in that broader context. I think I'd, what I'd like to bring out and, and what I also appreciated was that they also pointed to some of the things that I think um, feminist economists have really brought to the picture since the 80s and 90s, which is the importance of uh, uh, intra-household dynamics and bargaining here, and perhaps there's something we can dig into a bit more. Um, Ag Agnes mentioned you had done some qualitative work on that. Um, um, the importance of understanding the, the, what, what we used to call the reproductive as well as the productive economy, so mm -hmm. how women are using their time overall and the fact that they have uh, overall a much uh, larger work burden than men uh, on average if you add paid and unpaid work up in, in just about any country. Um, uh, and then the, the third point, um, which both speakers mentioned, was around a sort of understanding of social norms. And I'd sort of broaden that slightly to talk about social norms and, and institutions and how they sort of shape um, not only what happens in households, but also what happens in, in markets and in government institutions and, and sort of um, the whole process of gender dynamics. So I, I think the fact that both speakers kind of spoke to those was kind of interesting and, and, and shows how... Um, 
the, the, import, the influence of that uh, work that's been going on for a while. Um, the importance of the non-farm economy, I think, is, is, is you know, a headline message from, from both presentations. And um, you know, so I'd certainly agree that you know, if, if we're talking about women's empowerment, that women being, if, if you like, in uh, um, male-headed households as contributing family labor that's largely unpaid is not... Is not <laughs> The, the best position in terms of empowerment, but then the sort of non-farm activities or off-farm activities, you know, could cover a diverse range of things in in, in many mm -hmm. different contexts. Mm -hmm. I think, um, uh, you know, it could be rural non-farm enterprise, could be, you know, as Anita is suggesting, um, and I think that's an important point. Um, you know, can we look at value addition? activities in you know, see, seeing agricultural value chains and market systems rather than just looking at the production side and where are the new roles for women there that might be um, emerging. One thing that um, we didn't hear so much about was wage labour and I think um, um, so obviously agricultural wage labour I'm talking about partly so you know in Latin America um, uh, a lot of women got drawn into the agro export sectors and I think perhaps to some extent true in, in, in uh, some Asian economies as well. Um, so I think, you know, context matters. If, if the structure of your agricultural sector and your strategy is, is being driven a lot by large-scale commercial agriculture, then you're going to sort of draw women into those opportunities, which are also gendered, by the way, in terms mm -hmm. of the kind of mm -hmm. types of work and, and conditions that women are subjected to. So I think, yes, rural non-farm enterprise, but there are lots of things... Uh, rural non-farm uh, uh, employment and activity, but there are lots of elements to that and, and context um, matters. Um, another point, I think, which comes out strongly in, in Agnes' uh, work particularly is, is, you know, which women are we talking about? Uh, or which women and girls? And, and Steve particularly uh, highlighted girls in his presentation. Um, and, you know, a lot of your data, Agnes, is, is about <coughs> looking at um, a contrast between the experiences of female uh, managed farms and male managed farms, uh, which in some cases equates to household headship, but not all. Um, you've also talked about, you know, the experience of women in male in male headed households and the contrast there. But there are also other ways in which, you know, women's experience is contrasting between different regions of uh, uh, Nepal and different agroecological um, zones, uh, and also in the life cycle. Um, um, and on that, I wanted to come back to this issue of uh, time use and unpaid care and domestic work. Um, I mean, it's something on which more and more data is now becoming systematically available, which, you know, shows that, that everywhere uh, women, and rural women in particular, do more work, uh, unpaid work, than men, and that this is very slow to change, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, and also that you know, rural women on average uh, are, are doing at least uh, half an hour more than, than men. And this is increased if, if they are uh, having many children um, and uh, certain other factors if they're married, for example. So, I mean, this issue of what needs to be done to address women's unpaid care work, family planning is a long-term a long solution to that by mm -hmm. reducing the, the, the number of uh, children, but it, it's also just about, in, you know, currently what can be done, and I think there's, there's still just not enough emphasis on the amount of investment needed in rural infrastructure and services mm -hmm. that can alleviate those burdens, and Agnes mentioned the, the, the water and electricity, so there's, there's, there's clear evidence that investing in improved access to water will reduce women's um, time spent collecting water. Electrification is a bit more complicated because actually that can lead to women doing more paid work, but mm -hmm. you know at least mm -hmm. they have uh, the option. And finally, I mean, I wanted to just say that you know I think if we approach this from the perspective of um, rural women's well-being and, and rights, as as well as looking at it in the perspective of you know how is agricultural productivity driving that wider transformation, um, I think it, it perhaps, you know, shifts the emphasis of the types of intervention that we might be thinking about. Thank you. Great. Steve, I want to come back to you and let you see if you've got responses to either of the sets of comments. 
generally, or just just a couple of observations? Because I've talked I've talked about some of the some of the findings from from Thailand. The, sir, there are some intriguing uh, findings from the case of Peru. So a couple couple of things that are are interesting that come out of the Peruvian case. Sally has talked about the commercial the commercial agriculture sector, and of course you know very great concerns about what happens to migrant rural women when they end up as day laborers on largish farms producing things like the asparagus. Most of the asparagus you see in British supermarkets comes from Peruvian coastal farms, beautifully run, irrigated and so on, down on the coast. A lot of that is with migrant laborers from very poor rural women from up in the Sierra in, in the highlands. Um, and whilst labor conditions may not be perfect, they're not actually that bad. Half a million women have jobs on that, and we think that within the Peruvian rural labor market, that really has tightened up the rural labor markets to a point where the farms are beginning to run out of, run out of, of labor, and people are paid more than the, the, the minimum wage. So although when you see that kind of commercial agriculture, you immediately start to think there are a lot of dangers here, if you don't have an unending supply of cheap casual labor, if there's pressure on the rural labor market, this can actually tighten things up very usefully indeed. Now the other insight from rural Peru is this thing about what is the rural non-farm economy. And a huge driver of change in rural Peru since round of, since the early 2000s, and it's an extraordinary thing uh, to see if you haven't seen it. The Sierra Sur of Peru has always been one of the poorest areas, sorry, the southern highlands of Peru has always been one of the poorest parts of the whole of Latin America. And finally, it looks like the Peruvian state has found an effective answer to 450 years of discrimination against people in this area. Throw money at the problem. Finally, put in rural services, put in the water systems, put in the health, put in the schools, yes? And guess who delivers most of those services? Women, yeah? So big changes are now being reported in the Young Lives Project, yeah, where they talk to people in the Young Lives, and they say, yes, we've had the chance to send our, our, our girls to secondary school, but why send girls to secondary school? They're laughed at because they're peasants, they're laughed at because they speak Quechua, they're laughed at because they're, they're wearing traditional clothing. They spend two years, and then they come back to the village, they get married, and they recover their self-respect. But now we're working with our girls, and we're saying, stay there in schools, get the qualifications, because look at the senorita who runs the health center. You can be that person as long as you get your qualifications. So the demonstration effect of, of the Peruvian state finally putting in the services into these remote rural areas, creating a terrific demonstration effect within the village that says, well, my daughter could do that job, but she's got to get through secondary school. Um, and when you see these stories from, from the young lives with the personal narratives, they're, they're very dramatic, which is why I get so excited about them. And what you've just said ties back into what Agnes was saying earlier about the demonstration effect and, and seeing what yeah. some of these are. Did you have other comments you wanted to make in, in response? Just uh, briefly, um, I think, well, two, two reflections. One is on institutions and, and policies and the way that, um, well, central policies are translated into a village reality or a village context. Uh, because many of these countries have quite um, well well written policies, gender policies that don't really trickle down or they don't make it to the village level. But just it's and it's also an anecdotal um, piece. We were we were in the field in, in one of the Zambian communities this summer, um, and there's a, a chief in the area who's who's quite well known to for being progressive. So he was um, and he's had a strong stance on keeping girls in school, even if, if they become pregnant, they shouldn't leave school and so on. Um, and when I looked at the notes the other day, it said, well, getting land from the chief is not a problem. 
the problem is getting land from your family. So, so there's a, a sort of, even within a village, the social norms are layered and the institutions are layered in that sense that you can have a fairly progressive person in charge of a village, but you still have to deal with the, the dynamics in, in your household or in your clan or in your family. So that's one reflection. But also another one is that um, when we did earlier field work in this, this particular community, we, uh, we've started out by asking, well, over the past five years, um, would you say there have been changes? And then people answering group interviews, yes or no, or in most cases they say yes. And would you say there have been improvements? And I remember asking, well, what is, what is the one biggest improvement you've seen in this village? And it was a, a focus group with, with men, with male farmers. Um, and one person put up his hand and he said, well, the biggest change is that we now send our daughters to school. We didn't used to do that. So that's the biggest improvement we've seen over the past five years. So, and in that sense, perhaps uh, education policies are, are trickling down to a greater extent than policies on land rights or broader gender-based policies. But the, the strong push for primary education is, seems to be reaching um, the village level. Um, and that perhaps ties into the valuation of, of women more generally, to the long term, um, where, where women are um, are valued differently. Uh, I think the, the second reflection I had relates to, uh, to the opportunities in migration, like you were talking about migration to, um, uh, to agro-processing plants, sort of. But I think in the context of sub-Saharan Africa, we need to think more locally about rural non-farm opportunities or non-farm opportunities more generally, um, simply because the cities don't have that much to offer. Um, so I, I think it's, it's important to recognize the difference between Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa in the nature of urbanization as, as far as we can see now. So those were my reflections. We still have this question of whether, whether farming is really the way that what we should be investing in. How should we be thinking about farming if we want to improve the lives of rural men and women? We've had like a lot of the conversation has been about all of these other things that need to be done. And I would agree that many of them are, are quite important. And they're quite important for, for rural women. Um, but what are we saying about investments in, in farming? And are we saying that they should be investments in smallholder agriculture and really targeting women? Um, should we be targeting commercial agriculture? Is that the best way to affect rural women? Um, should we just say that? which some of the things that you read about all the disadvantages that women have in farming, um, that they don't have access to land or resources and the extension workers don't talk to them, suggest that maybe we should just leave that aside and say, let's get women into other kinds of jobs. Um, my mother grew up on a farm and did her very best. I always think of her. She got off that farm mm -hmm. as quickly as she could. She thought the opportunities were much better off farm, as did all three of her sisters, um, and her brother as well. They all got off the farm, <laughs> right? So we see, but, but the girls clearly were talking about wanting, wanting to get off the farm and talked about the kind of work that they had to do. Um, what, where does farming fit in with this? Um, is it, is it smallholder farming? Is it commercial farming? If we're trying to benefit rural women and girls, how should we be thinking about farming? Steve, I told you I was going to ask you that, so you can go first. <laughs> um, the position of farming in this is, is as farming is with the whole of development. It, it's the slightly paradoxical point that economic development everywhere involves the farming sector becoming relative, relatively less important fewer people working in it, a smaller share of GDP, and strong growth of the rest of the economy. And Thailand shows that in spadefuls. But although the Thai case shows that in spadefuls, the Thai economic, uh, agricultural, the Thai e agricultural growth has been quite spectacular since the 1960s, although it has been less spectacular than the growth of the rest of the economy. Um, and the continual growth of the agricultural economy 
gives people on low incomes an initial chance to progress, creates conditions for the rest of the economy, and then as the rest of the economy creates opportunities, we have the opportunities for broader-based, wider, more diversified growth, which certainly in the Thai case, in the Peruvian case, open up many more opportunities for rural women. So I think it's that way round that we need to, to, to think of things. When we look at the more the smaller detail of this, what we're actually doing on agricultural development, well, the models that we can see vary very considerably by context. Um, I don't think there are huge trade-offs in most things that we think of doing in agriculture, except, of course, the trade-offs between the division of land. You can't have um, giant farms and then everybody else having a, a, a small holding as well, not unless you've got un unlimited land. There are trade-offs at that level. But otherwise, most of the things you want to do for rural non-farm economies, most of the things you want to do for small farmers, medium farmers, and so on, good roads, um, investing in people, um, electricity. Most of the things that cost um, a lot of public money are common to most things you're doing in the village, yes? The things which are very specific to particular kinds of agriculture, such as the extension and research, these are essentially small ticket items within the public budget. Roads cost a lot of money. Schools cost a lot of money. Water systems cost a lot of money. Extension agents are relatively cheap, yes? So we can actually um, do most of this as long as we're aware of it, yes? So we don't have to think about whether we're targeting those to farmers particularly or just to rural communities. No, the, 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 this is the good news. If you, you know, <laughs> countries which invest in those basic services, good stuff tends to happen. And the Peruvians, the Peruvians are doing one, a, a remarkable experiment in throwing monies at the problems of the Sierra Sur. Throwing, yeah, it, it, it is a huge increase in the rural budgets going in there. Um, that sounds like they're being privileged. Actually, they're just getting the same level of services that people in Lima have got, yes? So they're, 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 they're um, plugging the gap between urban and rural areas. Great. Agnes, did you want to respond to this? <laughs> well, I, I tend to agree. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think maybe I should also mention, um, as, as you may recall, I said that commercialization has benefited female farm managers. It's just benefited male farm managers more. So, I mean, it's, it's widened the gender gap, but it's, it's not as if women haven't benefited from commercial processes. Um, and actually, when, when we looked at prices received by female farm managers and compared them to male farm managers, they receive exactly the same prices for their produce. So it seems then that uh, it's not an institutional discrimination against women in output markets, but um, a lack of surplus production that they can sell. So there's a need to deal with, with productivity issues. Um, and then also, again, the issue of mobility, of actually reaching markets and being able to, to use the proceeds from, from sales themselves, whether within uh, households or, or whether they're heading their own households. So. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, I, um, on commercial agriculture, I think um, th there are lots more opportunities than are currently being used to, to really um, see women benefiting from that. And I think there have been some important pioneering efforts by some private sector organizations working with NGOs to really see how we can create more visible roles for women in agricultural value chains, not just at production level where they're contributing labor, but in, in, in other roles in trading, in um, processing, um, uh, and also actually having some stake, some ownership in, in um, you know, the, the, the um, processing and marketing systems. So there's a point there also about organization and something that we, we haven't really talked about. And I think this is really critical from a sort of rural women's empowerment perspective is um, particularly um, in smallholder systems, but uh, 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 at large is how we really promote uh, women to uh, work collectively. We build their agency and leadership, um, both in order to sort of, um, you know, 
uh, overcome some of the constraints you're, you're talking about, Agnes, around bulking and, and, and being able to access the markets and services, because some women can, right? Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, so groups of women who then uh, can, can work with the women who are mobile to market their, their, their produce, for example. Um, but also, um, you know, that, that then creating a, a sort of scope for women to de develop the leadership and agency to then be in the bigger institutions and, um, for <laughs> to, to put it crudely, sort of challenge some of the male power in those institutions or at least contend with, contend with it. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, I agree to, of course, like, oh, what oh, all of us says, it, it's not, I mean, there's, there's nothing to disagree about it. I mean, it's just that pushing women, for example, in price fixing, to take a very concrete example, if we look at Nepal, for example, if you look at 2016-17 data, like tea, coffee, and spices were one of the high export values. We had the high, it covered like 10% of Nepal's export. But if you look at where women are in that sector, they are just they are picking up the tea leaves or picking up the coffees, right? So the question then is, if you want to use agriculture for women's economic empowerment, we have to look at like where women are in the broader macroeconomic agriculture kind of um, in that scenario, and then raise them up from like you know, for example, from uh, tea pickers to to where they are able to negotiate and fix the price of the produce. So I think that that that's what we all are saying about. Well, let's open it up again if. If you're online, you can add questions in the chat box. And for those of you here, I'll take some questions. Got to get the microphones going around. So start here, and then we'll go over here. Please introduce yourself. Um, thank you. Is it on? OK. Um, I'm KC Lai, uh, independent consultant, uh, working in this area for quite a few years. Uh, well, I think some of uh, my <coughs> observations over the years resonate <laughs> to a large extent with what has been said. And uh, perhaps I, if I can just share some of these observations. I think you mentioned Zambia. And I think if I'm not, if I can remember correctly, back in uh, the 80s and early 90s, in the northwestern province area, uh, there were agricultural programs that introduced uh, high yielding maize, but also village mills. And I think the combination of the two, the interaction of agriculture with, if you like, a value addition, made a huge difference to women's incomes, not only in terms of uh, what you call uh, access to, to the, the new, new streams of new income streams, but also the control of the income. Maize, which uh, is now um, <clears throat> more available, were used by women and I think church groups as well uh, to make beer, for instance. And the beer money comes back, sale of beer comes back to the women. They now have the money which they control compared to money that comes back to the farm, which the men control. And that, I think, has enormous implications for nutrition education, etc. So I think that's one point that came over with me, having uh, <coughs> worked in that region. And another observation, Ethiopia. If you take a casual walk through farms in Ethiopia during the plowing season, sometimes you observe that the men who are plowing have beautiful <coughs> animals, strong animals, oxen, and uh, doing a very, very good job. And then you see a woman with an animal, scrawny, you know, <laughs> just struggling to, to plow the field. And it seems to me that there is some discrimination in terms of the input into agriculture. Women can't get the oxen they want at the time they want. It's usually later, which also has an impact on yields because we plant late. You know, yields are also impacted upon. Anyway, uh, those two points. But also another uh, observation is uh, in India. Uh, the World Bank has invested with the in, uh, government of India quite a lot in rural livelihood programs and projects, which includes the National Rural Livelihood Program, but also many state-run programs uh, in Bihar, uh, Odisha, also in uh, Chhattisgarh. 
A very interesting point here, which Mitch may touch on the uh, question of uh, infrastructure, uh, investment, and so on, is also investment in empowerment, not only of uh, uh, financial or economic nature, but social and political nature. When you have social and political empowerment, you have a chance to uh, get women into positions where they make an influence. In the case of Chhattisgarh, uh, there were a lot of very useful uh, common interest group activities and certainly made a huge difference. But there was no great uh, push to, to link up these activities. Whereas in other states, for example in Bihar, the, uh, there was a lot of con uh, focus on convergence and on mainstreaming of uh, some of these services such as banking, and now uh, the commercial banks are linked to a lot of other uh, rural finance uh, uh, initiatives. And therefore, it now becomes a joined up kind of approach, which uh, makes a huge difference compared to isolated, small scale, uh, so-called microfinance interventions. They have absolutely very, very limited impact. What one needs, obviously, from, from our ex observations is a very clear strategy of joining up services, linking them to state-run services, and enabling, uh, if you like, uh, synergy between the different initiatives. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. We had one over here. Thank you. Fascinating uh, summaries of interesting research. Thank you. I'm Karen Johnson from the Department for International Development Agriculture team. So I recognize that the focus of the research and of today's discussion is women as agricultural producers. But I'm interested also if your research has given you any insights into women as consumers of farm production. So has nutrition for rural women for urban women changed over the time of your studies, either because they have more control of their income or more income, or <coughs> because of changing production patterns. So any reflections on nutrition and women's consumption of farm produce? Great. Got one more question here. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I'm Cohen or Chowdhury from Fair Trade Foundation. And um, so I just wanted to, uh, a clarification on, um, the, so there's been discussion on non-farm income and uh, agribusiness and um, value addition. And I just wanted to check, did you um, look at data on value addition and um, agribusiness and whether that has improved the lives of rural women or not? Great, we've got one coming from from online, which is asking about the sort of interventions, whether there have been interventions that have been successful to tackle inter-household social dynamics to improve the incomes and lives of rural women. Um, so what, and, and I'll open that up to, to any of you, but really thinking about this, this question of control over income has come up a number of times. And I think one of the really interesting and important questions is how as people are doing projects and programs, do we ensure that these kind of changes that women have access and some control over, over the income that gets generated? So somebody want to, we've got four questions out here. Are you ready to start? Can I respond on that last yes. point? Yes. So, so, I mean, on, on the last question about what, you know, what's, what interventions are trying to tackle those intra-household dynamics, I mean, I think in the, in the last, uh, five to ten years especially, um, quite a lot of organizations working at grassroots level have been beginning to really integrate approaches on uh, working around social norms with uh, understandings of, you know, wider agricultural development processes um, and use some different kinds of, you know, methodologies, um, community dialogues, working with male gatekeepers, engaging men and boys in different ways to try and address those. And I think there's now sort of a, you know, a, not a huge, but some body of evidence that, that 
you know, sh shows some things that uh, <coughs> are, are helpful and, 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 and can work. Um, but I, I think a challenge for those efforts has, is, 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 you know, can, can they work at scale? <laughs> How do you sort of scale, scale these things up? Um, um, but, you know, some interesting examples from INGOs such as Oxfam and CARE and, and others where they have really worked with men and men, women in communities to look at time use patterns, to, to, to discuss those, but also, you know, looked at particular, looked at decision making in households at particular key moments in the agricultural cycle. Um, so uh, where, where are we, what, what, what land are we using for what in the pre-sowing uh, period, you know, how are we spending our incomes in, in the post-harvest period? So actually integrating that sort of thinking about household dy dynamics with the agricultural cycle, which I think is kind of a, an interesting sort of new approach, if you like, to, to, to how you might think about extension work and, and uh, integrating that into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think others have done important work on looking at uh, how, how communities manage unpaid care. So I think there is a growing sort of body of practice out there. The, the challenge is how do we how do we do this at scale? Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, just to add to it, I think it's also, I mean, the 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 interventions around how, but also an important intervention around why, for example, whether you start tackling norms, social norms when people are old, or whether you inculcate it in when people are still young, when they are you know developing their identity around the social norms. So a lot of programs around adolescence, for example, by UNICEF plan. Have been now have now started working with adolescent boys to teach them these kind of social norms and also showing like what household responsibility. I mean, what happens if you divide care work um, within men and women, and also working with uh, husband and wife together. And that's, then the government of Nepal has a program where I mean, it's it's from it's two kinds of. Uh, address gender-based violence, but the strategy is use women's economic empowerment as a way to address gender-based violence. So that's their strategy. And they're working together with bringing together husband and wife and then showing them in a very practical way, like what would happen, wh how, like what is the, what does the daily life of a wi wife look like? What does the daily wife of a, a life of a husband looks like? And what do you do? What happens if you transform these a bit? Like make small changes. What if you send the women to, you know, to a farm or like in a collective way, like a group of women bringing together and trying to do vegetable farming? So what happens if you send her to do that work? And and that has brought a very good change. I mean, I think a lot of um, a lot of um, uh, a lot of problems have been solved by engaging these men and boys, but also not threatening the norms directly, but bringing them in dialogue together with, like you know, with with, with the women together, and this seems to have worked uh, quite well. Great. I think there was one question on yeah. data. So uh, no, <laughs> it's, the, it's the answer. We didn't collect data on on uh, agro enterprise of, or value addition. Not in our data set. I don't know about Steve. But. If we want the answer to this about value addition, I know where we need to go look. A, to find out how it works, and B, to have a look at the gender dimensions, and this is Thailand. Um, Thailand seems to have been blessed in its agricultural development by a private sector group of merchants, traders, agro-processors, who did a, an extraordinary job in turning northeast Thailand from being a backwater of the country to an agricultural export powerhouse. Some of you will know this from the World Bank study called The Sleeping Giant, which looked at northeast Brazil and also the, well, it looked at the Cerrado of Brazil and it looked at northeast Thailand. Uh, and in North, northeast Thailand, there have been some extraordinarily savvy private entrepreneurs that part of the story is rather well known. What isn't well known is where there's been a huge surge in agricultural exports in Thailand in the last 10, 15 years. Now, that's a surge on the back of an already rising graph for agricultural exports. But what is the surge composed of? Uh, it's an astonishing answer. Pet food and canned chicken. Yes? <laughs> you know this. Uh, you do. You can guess. I mean, the pet the pet food is simply that Thailand has an awful lot of cassava, which you can export at a very low price, 
or you can you can combine it with protein coming from the fishing bycatch and so on, and you can make pet food and export this to Japan and the United States. And as you can imagine, dog owners in Tokyo pay a great deal more for embodied cassava than <laughs> than if you just ship cassava chips to Rotterdam, you know, for for livestock farmers in Europe. So that would be the that's something I would love to get money to go to to go study, and. Um, how exactly was that value uh, created, and in what way is it is is it gendered? Uh, so it's a really good question. Um, it invites many more questions than we've got answers to. Where do you get these super savvy people from, and how do you make them productive rather than just rent seeking? Karen asked the question about um, women as consumers. Uh, we looked as women as economic participants, human development, mothers, sons and wives, agents, you name it. We never thought about that question about uh, is, there, is there a consumption and a nutrition side. We kind of took it, as, took it for granted that if, if women were getting higher incomes, their nutrition would improve, particularly if it's combined with better access. To, to cleaner water, cleaner sanitation, better, better health services. <laughs> but have people actually got better diets is a, is a usefully challenging uh, question because we know an awful lot of places in the developing world. Uh, Ghana is a good example. We were having a seminar a week or so ago about with, with Ghanaian researchers where we say it is astonishing how many Ghanaian smallholders now do not bother to produce their own food because they know they can get food in the local markets. And what food can you get in the local markets? Packets of instant noodles are always there. The changing reality of rural Africa, yeah? It really doesn't depend on the maize harvest because southern Ghana is swamped by imports of those sachets of instant noodles. And who likes the instant noodles? The youngsters who won't eat fufu anymore. Good heavens. Um, <laughs> it's progress of a kind, but not everything is, 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 is entirely satisfactory. A very good question, but we don't have the answer, I'm afraid. I, mean, just, I think the other aspect of that, which is a complex question, um, is, is again back to, to time use. And... Um, there's a sort of processing, cooking time, energy use of different um, consumer, uh, for consumers, uh, urban consumers, but also rural consumers. And, and that is, I'm sure, playing into nutritional out outcomes in both direct and indirect ways. Yeah, just compare the time to do the instant noodles compared <laughs> to the time to do the foo foo. <laughs> yes. All right, let's take one more round of questions. We've got a couple here. Let's, yeah, these two here. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Chavunga from the British Blockchain Association and also University of Surrey. Uh, thank you for your presentations, really, really good. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of what your thoughts are on the role of technology to help with uh, farming, um, but also to help with connectivity. I'm, I'm quite passionate, I'm from Zambia as well. Originally, uh, I'm quite passionate about uh, looking at, uh, you know, women at the very lower end and helping them to connect and also interact into sort of global value chains, supply chains. So I just wondered what your thoughts are around new technologies and how it can help with that. Hi, I'm Kenda Cunningham, Helen Keller International, based in Kathmandu. Um, I just uh, had a question for the panelists because there's a lot of discussion about women and men and what we're finding in Nepal is that it depends which woman you're talking about and with which woman you're doing your study with. And so we have tried to take different quantitative and qualitative tools, including the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, and apply it to multiple men and women in the same household in, in a large-scale survey. And we're really struggling to make sense of the data because even on very simple topics of who controls income, who has access to information, who makes decisions, um, it really depends who you ask. And so from a methods perspective, I'd be really interested in if anyone has experience <laughs> in diving deeper on which woman says what um, and also how we can be more careful in couching our finding to not um, lump all women together. Thank you. Several over here in the very front. Hi, my, 
Hi, my name's Alex Zerklark. I'm from the Coalition for Global Prosperity. There was a little bit of discussion about the decreasing importance of the agricultural sector as development continues. And I was curious about whether agriculture can be seen as a kind of gateway to other sectors through investment in a pre-existing industry. Is there a kind of a, an observable tipping point where does investment in agriculture and the infrastructure that goes with it open up investment in other sectors? Yeah, there was a couple others back in here. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Bisme, and I uh, just completed my master's research from Queen Mary. And I was researching uh, female mobility in Pakistan. So uh, my question was for Steve, actually. You mentioned that uh, in Egypt, you, uh, in, within the study in Egypt, you found that the mobility was more restricted than in, say, Thailand or Peru. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about how that impacted the results. I mean, in terms of uh, was, did the lives of women, were they less, uh, did they improve, <laughs> you know, less because of that mobility? And uh, whether there were any suggestions about how that can be countered then? Okay. Hi, this is Mariella Lamat from University of Amsterdam. Um, I have a question just out of curiosity. Did you, did any of the panelists come across any um, opportunities or any examples in vocational training institutes or agricultural vo vocational training that can help changing or shifting or creating dialogue about these gender norms that are affecting uh, women's participation in agriculture and the economy? Thank you. Is there one more there? Okay, we'll do, okay, we'll do these two and then we'll, We'll collect them all and then get everybody to give us a quick answer. I think my question is sort of somewhat related to which women you talk to, but I was wondering whether you noticed any trend in the age of women in agriculture, because we see in a lot of countries, you know, the, the agricultural population is an aging population, and what implications does that have if all the young women are leaving um, and it becomes an older, it's the older women that are left? Um, and yes, and following on from that, what impact are climate change and increasing volatility um, in climate and responses to that is having on women's participation in agriculture as a, as a way to um, uh, exit from poverty? Great. Okay, one more. Yes. Quick one here. And then... Yeah. Uh, my question <laughs> is to Sally. Could you just a little bit elaborate on feminism and rural women and girls? <laughs> All right, we have <clears throat> one more from the people online, which is, does the panel know of any good examples of positive discrimination to create opportunities for women in the design and implementation of new outgrower schemes in commercial agriculture? So we have a huge range of possible things that we could talk about, and we don't have very, we've got about five or six minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll give everybody just a chance to answer whichever pieces of things you like. And then we are going to have a reception afterwards. So if your question doesn't get answered, come corner us. I'm not sure we can quite tackle all of these in the time we've got left. <laughs> Agnes, do you want to start? Just a, a small reflection on uh, the methodology issue of who you're talking to. And I think there's what, what we've found again then based on small scale qualitative interviews is that there be may be gender norms that sort of dictate or at least influence who does what and sort of the division of labor and that sort of thing but there are also norms tied to things like family and what is a family and who <laughs> how do you view a family and who's the head of household and so i think and and even in like matrilineal systems for instance we found that women would still refer to their husbands as the head of, fam head of the household and he was the main decision maker. When asked, well, why does he make the decisions and not you? And they would say, well, of course he makes the decisions. He's the head of household. So it was, it was sort of an, a circular discussion. But um, so, so I think perhaps recognizing the norms outside gender also, <laughs> this is the broader social norms in particular contexts may be useful for interpreting the answers of, of people <laughs> in general in, in interviews. Yeah, I, I think I'm mean, coming from Nepal, I know what you're talking about. Of course, there's a huge difference between norms in, 
in case of Tibetan Burman communities and the Indo-Aryan communities, and again the Indo-Aryan communities from the plains and the Indo-Aryan communities from the from the Tarai region. So I, I I mean I see where the struggle is about. And in terms of yes, yes, you are correct. I mean we have been doing with ODI a lot of research on adolescent girls, and we find that as girls start getting into their mid adolescence, 15 over till like you know your reproductive age, 45 years, there's a there's a huge pressure for you to you know adhere to the norms, and norms become very stringent and very uh, very inflexible for those. But as you as you are when you are younger or when you pass that age, norms starts becoming a bit more flexible for women themselves. So of course there are so many cross sections, right? Like in terms of caste, class, ethnicity, but also in terms of age. I think these are things that we we should be mindful about. I would just add on the question about the data and what you do when you get lots of different responses. I would love to talk to you about that. That's one of the things I spend a lot of time thinking about. We found certainly that it, in thinking about not everybody within the household, but when you interview men and women, you get different responses and trying to think about, well, what do you do then with that data? Um, people's one reaction is often to throw out some of it, and if you're going to throw it out, then you shouldn't have collected it in the first place. But to look at when men and women agree um, and how that matters, and we found in some work we did in Bangladesh that outcomes for women were better if we look at kind of the things we typically think about that women bargain for when they have more bargaining power, that if we ask men and women questions about who makes decisions and who owns the assets, the best outcomes are when husbands and wives agree that women own assets and women um, are involved in decision making. But when just the women do it, that's good too. Not as good as when they agree, but it's, it's good. So her sense of whether or not she's empowered in some sense does matter. Um, just whether or not they agree doesn't seem to matter because a lot of times they agree that she's she doesn't own anything and doesn't make any decisions and that there's not good ne outcomes necessarily associated with that. But there's quite a few of us now really trying to think about what you do with that data once you've, once you've got it. Um, so picking up the question that was directly asked to me about um, feminism and rural women and girls, um, uh, my, my specific reference to feminism was to, to sort of mention how feminist economics has sort of contributed to, to thinking about how rural households work and, and market systems and the importance of the um, reproductive uh, uh, care economy, I guess. Um, uh, I wasn't necessarily speaking about feminism as an aspect of rural and women and girls' lives. Um, that said, I mean, <laughs> uh, I strongly believe that, you know, um, mobilization and organization of women and then however they want to define their needs and interests is really key to uh, development for rural uh, uh, women and girls and, and particularly for, uh, for, for younger women. And so in the sort of basic sense of women coming together to define their common interests, I, I would say that, you know, feminism <laughs> is, is as, as important in rural Africa as anywhere else. Um, a couple of reflections on the various questions there. Uh, this question of technology, um, if, if we wanted to have a look at that, one of the places I would love to see uh, an ancillary study is uh, the slopes of Mount Meru in northern, in, in northern Tanzania, where we've had this interesting process of the decline of the coffee crop, which the women have actually been applauding because... It was the crop where they had to do a lot of work and the men just took the money. And the rise of carrots, potatoes, cauliflowers as a replacement crop for the local market, but something into which women can then um, get more, more access. Um, where's technology in this? It's about skilling, isn't it? It's about things that give women better uh, command over information, and skills, and certainly the things we saw in Nepal last November, November with women in Nepali hill villages, um, you introduce rural women to the right kind of technology, and <laughs> they're, if anything, more excited about it than the boys are. Um, <laughs> as long as you've got the right kind of, the right kind of technology. Um, now, the really challenging question from Pakistan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Women's norms on, on mobility. A couple of things I would comment from the Egyptian case study. The Egyptian case study is the one where things are horribly blocked. 
Um, still quite high fertility, grow, uh, fertility rates in Egypt. Um, very fast population growth. Huge cohorts of youth coming onto the labor market every year in Egypt, meaning that that Egyptian labor market is absolutely a powder keg. Can you create the millions of jobs every year you need in a very large nation like Egypt that gives young people prospects and takes them away from conceptions of violence as a, as, as, as a way forward? Um, women's mobility, women's fertility is part of that larger process of the knife edge on which Egypt is at the moment. This point about mobility, it's, it's almost inexplicable because we have the case of Morocco, yeah, where we have a large tourist industry, where we have assembly plants. Women are in those bo both of those, but that could not happen in Egypt. Why not? We don't know. There's a wonderful pilot case, and we're always finding <coughs> wonderful pilot cases, and then we find an evaluation of the pilot case that says it isn't quite so wonderful, but there's a wonderful program in rural, in, in, in rural Egypt which works with adolescent girls 13 to 17 years old, um, just appraising gender, skills, opportunities, uh, and so on, prospects for young girls. You can imagine, you know, that donors have piled in on that particular program. Early reports were that it was working well, that it was acceptable. Is it making progress in rural Egypt? Can it be scaled up? Is it really doing the things they say? The usual multiple questions that we have as development specialists. So there are interesting things taking place. Can they make the difference? I don't know. <laughs> All right, we've got time. I'm going to have each of the panelists give us kind of one final answer um, to maybe to the broader question on, you know, back to our, you know, what do we do for rural, for rural women and girls, um, and where does farming fit in? Or you can make a final point related to any of the things we've got. So one minute each. Yeah. Um, I think we need to consider farming. <laughs> um, but I think there's also one aspect uh, related to what, uh, what aspects are generalizable ac across different contexts. So these broad-based sort of changes that Steve is, is pointing to and what aspects are so localized that they may even differ from one particular local context to the next. And I think that's a, that's a challenge for development practitioners, perhaps less than for researchers. But I think the, the data and, and the presentations here today show the, those challenges, but also great opportunities, actually, for, for generalizability. But yeah, thank you. Well, I think as Steve uh, said earlier, it's a, it's a, agriculture is a good point to start with. It's the most relevant point. Also, if we look at Nepal and a lot of South Asian countries, given the norms that that are there, it's it's a good, it's a very, it's it's a very um, good place to start with. But as we discussed here, I, I think pay attention to the other broader dimension and the individual capacity raising of these women and girls. So I, I think we have to, yeah, we have to focus on some of the key challenges in agriculture, which, as was mentioned, are the discrimination and access to inputs for the productive process um, but equally important I think is the addressing the social norms as we've, as we've mentioned um, enabling women to, to organize and, and to come together collectively but I think we, we have to think beyond agriculture and um, about the potential for uh, rural services provision and infrastructure provision to actually drive women's employment opportunities and therefore stimulate a, a, a sort of change in perception of women's um, women's opportunities so beyond agriculture, I would say. And as a last point, I'd say that what our studies show is that there are plenty of lessons on how you can get changes in the material conditions of the lives of rural women and girls. Um, and they're fairly simple and, and, and straightforward lessons. But as always, um, 
you discover you can you can create certain number of lessons, but there's still a lot of important questions to answer, and particularly the questions about gender norms. Some gender norms do seem to move with changes in material conditions, but others get blocked at particular points, and that's probably one of the things that we now need to to work on looking at these pilots and seeing what does make a bigger difference on the move towards gender equality. Great, thank you. Well, I get to sum up, which is always fun. <laughs> um, it seems to me that women are involved in agriculture, and if we don't pay attention to them, um, we're going to, and, and don't pay attention to the particular kinds of constraints that they face, um, we're liable to make in programs that make them worse off um, or to simply ignore them so that although things are changing, um, if we're interested particularly in poverty kinds of programs, um, we need to be sure that we're, we're reaching women but also that we're not, le as, as agriculture, one of the things that we see across the world that is agriculture becomes less important, right, and other things become, other sectors become more important. Right. When land becomes less valuable, it's easier for women to get it. When the, to do the kinds of subsistence and lower paid kinds of jobs, women can do those in agriculture. So we, we need to be careful not to either prioritize agriculture or to, to completely ignore it. And I think the other challenge really is to think about how we make sure that women are positioned to take, uh, take advantage of new opportunities, whether they're in the agricultural sector or in the non-agricultural sector. And in terms of the norms, when it's possible to do programs, whether they're commercial or NGOs going in with new opportunities, if they can be framed in such a way that they're outside of how the existing norms are, right? So that it's not, we're not adding to the income that is always controlled by men, right? This is men's income. If we have men earning more of this income, it's going to be really hard to change that so that women can do it. But when it's possible to frame it as something new that women can be involved in, I think that, that provides us with some new kinds of opportunities. Let me thank the four of you all for being here and participating in the panel. I think this was quite interesting. And to thank the audience who's here, both the audience in the room and the audience online, and to ODI for hosting the event. Um, if you keep an eye on ODI.org for further upcoming events. And for those of you in the room, and apologies to those not in the room, you are welcome to join us out in the lobby for a reception. So thank you very much. <laughs>